Hello, almighty all. Today, I will be speaking about message passing programs, in particular reactors, and about eight different ways to handle non-blocking returns in them. In addition, I'll try to make a very brief overview of existing proposals under consideration by C++ committee, also known as WG21, and we'll try to demonstrate how do they fit into our non-blocking returns. That's a lot of stuff, and to fit into a lot of time, it has to be a very intensive session. My apologies if anything looks too sketchy. In the end, I will try to provide a few pointers uh, where further information can be found. Before we can really start with the talk, I'd like to make an important announcement. I have to confess that uh, this is not really my presentation. Rather, it is a talk by Dadam, this guy. And you can also see him on my T-shirt, too. It means uh, that uh, if there is anything good with this presentation, uh, it should be attributed to me. And if there is anything bad, it is, all, it is all his fault. By the way, if you think that my accent is bad, you should be grateful that it is not him speaking. I can assure you that uh, his accent is much worse than mine. As you may guess, uh, it is quite difficult to produce human sounds uh, for a rabbit. Preliminaries aside, we can proceed with the substance of the talk. In part zero of the talk, well, as we are in C++ land, we have to start everything with zero, I'll try to define what is the task we are going to solve. First, we will have an extremely brief overview of message passing and reactors, including their benefits. And then we will include non-blocking processing, which is very closely related to interactions between main processing and return processing. In particular, we'll mention that, depending on whether we want to process intervening waits while waiting for the result of our outstanding call, non-blocking processing can be simpler than blocking one. Uh, there is no one single definition of message passing, but to convey the idea, I think that it is the best uh, to use the following adage uh, from uh, effective Go. Do not communicate by sharing memory, instead share memory by communicating. While uh, this wording doesn't come from C++ land, it does convey the concept, which is more or less equivalent to shared nothing. In practice, it means three things. First, all the processing within business logic is confined to one single thread, or at least as if it is one single thread. Second, uh, there is no memory sharing, which in, terms, in turn means that all the mutexes are gone. Last but not least, uh, we should have a way to pass messages between different threads, processes, or even different computers. Unfortunately, we don't have time to get into detailed discussions on the benefits of message passing, so I will just list them here, highlighting the most interesting ones. Most importantly, message passing allows to avoid cognitive overload, which arises whenever we are trying to deal both with business logic and with thread synchronization at the same time. This, in turn, simplifies programming greatly. Second, with message passing, it is easy to make our programs deterministic, which in turn enables such goodies as uh, production post-mortem debugging. Yes, it is used in practice. And uh, replay-based regression testing. And when it comes to concurrency, scalability, and performance, message passing architectures tend to beat mutex-based ones too in particular due to zero contention and due to avoiding expensive uh, thread context switches. Uh, and context switch can cost up to a million CPU clock cycles, cycles if we account for cache validation. Another performance-related consideration uh, is that uh, message passing programs tend to have much better spatial locality. And overall, from scalability point of view, uh, message passing architectures are shared nothing and shared nothing, uh, architectures rules forever. Uh, 
There are many different ways to implement message passing. However, for, to be specific for this talk, uh, I'll concentrate on one single incarnation of message passing, uh, the one which I prefer to uh, call reactors. Reactors are historically known under different names. Actors, reactors, event-driven programs, and ad hoc finite state machines. Uh, they are widely used in very different uh, programming environments, from uh, GUI to HPC with game development in between, and uh, are supported by different programming languages and frameworks, starting from uh, Windows Messages uh, and all the way to Node.js. Now it certainly looks as a good time for C++ to start supporting event-driven programs as first-class citizens too. Most important for us, however, is that while from now on we'll be speaking only about reactors, most of our findings are generalizable to more generic message passing. One exception is related to allocator-related serialization. While it does work for reactors, at the moment I don't know uh, how to generalize it to all the message passing programs. As we'll be speaking in terms of reactors quite a bit, let's establish some uh, basic terminology which we'll use. Let's name a common denominator for all our reactors a generic reactor. As we can see, it is an almost empty class with uh, abstract class with only one uh, pure virtual function react. There are different interpretations available. We will stick to this one. Let's name infrastructure code a code which calls our reactor react. Pretty often, though uh, not uh, strictly required, it, is, uh, uh, it happens inside uh, so-called event loop, shown on the slide. As we can see, uh, uh, it, uh, everything happens in one single thread, so there is no need uh, to have any kind of thread synchronization within a reactor react. As for a get event function, uh, it can uh, get events from pretty much anything, starting from select, poll, epoll, kq on the server side, or um, using libraries such as libuv on the client side. I have to note that uh, event loop is not uh, the only way we can use our reactors. Uh, in particular, it is perfectly possible to have uh, thread pools calling reactors as long as we are synchronizing on the reactor before going into reactor react. But in any case, what is really important is that we are avoiding all kinds of thread synchronizations within our reactor react. And finally, let's name any specific derivative from our generic reactor, a specific reactor. It is the place where all our uh, business logic will be implemented. Uh, one further thing to note is that uh, uh, virtual function-based implementation is certainly not, not the only one possible for reactors and that we can achieve uh, pretty much the same result but using templates. This one is just uh, simpler to demonstrate. After we defined our landscape, let's see what is the specific problem I'm trying to discuss today. It is a problem of non-blocking processing. Non-blocking code has a pretty bad reputation among developers. In particular, it is perceived to be significantly more complicated than equivalent blocking code. As we'll see uh, a bit later, uh, in part it can be attributed to, uh, the, to the lack of adequate support for non-blocking processing in the programming languages. But in addition, there is a little bit of confusion about the context of uh, non-blocking processing. In practice, it happens that we have to distinguish two very different scenarios. The first scenario 
arises when we do not need to process anything while waiting for the result of our outstanding call. In this case, if going uh, for non-blocking processing, we'll be doing it only for performance reasons. And indeed, uh, in this case, uh, code complexity of non-blocking uh, code will increase compared to the blocking code. The second scenario occurs uh, when uh, we do need to process intervening events while waiting for the result of our outstanding operation. Examples of such situations are numerous. Uh, as one all-important example, uh, for an interactive program, refusing to process inputs uh, while waiting for a result of outstanding over the internet operation uh, will result in effectively hanged program, which is pretty much suicidal. And uh, if we will look at this second scenario from the point of view of code complexity, we will see that while non-blocking code can be ugly, blocking code to implement the same interaction uh, between processing of return from uh, our non-blocking call, uh, from our outstanding call, and main processing, will we need to resort to thread synchronization, uh, which happens to be uh, much worse uh, than non-blocking code. In particular, I'm of a very strong opinion that combining of uh, uh, business logic with thread synchronization in the same piece of code almost in inevitably leads uh, to, uh, to cognitive overload, exceeding uh, that uh, magic number of seven plus minus two entities which we can uh, deal with simultaneously. This in turn means that uh, reasoning about blocking code which processes intervening events inevitably uh, becomes extremely difficult. This dual nature of complexity with relation to non-blocking processing leads us to the concept of mostly non-blocking processing, where we'll use non-blocking processing only if there is a chance that we do need to process intervening events while we are waiting for the results of our outstanding call. On the other hand, under most non mostly non-blocking processing, we may block as long as the outstanding operation is short enough, so we can postpone processing until uh, of the intervening events uh, until we have uh, the result. One such example includes accessing local disk or local database. For most of real-world scenarios, we can say that if this takes too long, we should be already speaking about fault recovery and not about non-blocking processing. Unfortunately, we don't have time to elaborate on mostly non-blocking processing. What, mostly, what is mostly important for us now is that mostly non-blocking processing or otherwise, we are mostly interested in interactions between main control flow and processing of returned values. Uh, let me repeat it once again. It is all about interactions, pretty much nothing else. Now we can get to the real stuff. In part of one of the talk, we'll define uh, the holy grail of our non-blocking processing. In general, we'd want our non-blocking processing to be as close uh, uh, to the blocking one as possible, but there is a significant caveat related to those interactions which I mentioned just a few seconds ago. Then we'll proceed to taking a quick look at uh, eight different uh, ways of handling non-blocking returns, one by one. Of course, given our time restrictions, detailed analysis is not possible, uh, but as promised before, I will provide pointers to a more detailed discussion at the end of the talk. <coughs> to compare different ways of handling non-blocking returns, we'll take one simple uh, closed real-world example, and we'll see how our eight different approaches will handle it. 
the idea uh, of the processing which will use the litmus test uh, for our different ways of non-blocking processing is shown on the diagram. We have a game and the player who wants to purchase uh, something to be used in the game. Player tells what uh, he wants to purchase uh, to the client, then client sends a request to our cashier reactor, then cashier reactor sends a database request to database reactor. On receiving reply, uh, there are two possible cases. Uh, if uh, transactions has failed for whatever reason, we return error uh, back to the client. But if uh, uh, it is, it, uh, purchase was successful, we have to issue another request to game world reactor so that item becomes available in the game world. On receiving reply uh, back from the game world, we uh, send uh, okay reply back to the client. By the standards of distributed systems, it qualifies as a very, very simple uh, uh, use case. But as we'll see, uh, it is sufficient to demonstrate the differences uh, in non-blocking processing. Let's take a look at the blocking code which implements uh, the logic on the uh, diagram on the previous slide. Uh, while it is clear that non-blocking code cannot be really uh, that as simple as blocking code, we should at least uh, try to have it as close as possible. In this blocking version, everything looks uh, very simple. There is a very modest amount of boilerplate code, and the essence of our interactions is very clear. First, we are making a blocking RPC call to our database reactor. And then, depending on the result of the first call, we may issue another blocking RPC call to our game world reactor. That's pretty much it. Let's also note that for this uh, type of code, we have to assume that we do have some kind of interface definition language, IDL and an ideal compiler which generates tabs and skeletons for these blocking RPC functions. When the bright future uh, described by Herb Sutter uh, in his talk on Wednesday materializes, we will be able to have in-language ideal, but at this time we are not there yet. We will also assume uh, that our ideal compiler is sufficiently universal or written by ourselves, which is certainly not a rocket science, and that it will be able to generate anything we need, not only for this blocking uh, processing, but also for all our uh, eight variations of non-blocking processing, which we'll see later. When looking at uh, our blocking code, we have to note uh, that for non-blocking purposes, blocking code we have seen is not exactly ideal. In particular, as our non-blocking code is all uh, about allowing interactions with our uh, reactor state, uh, while uh, the call is outstanding, it means the state of our reactor can change while uh, we are within the call. As a result, the code on the slide may occasionally fail. Compared to the previous slide, all we did is just adding those two highlighted lines. And while in blocking code they are perfectly fine, in non-blocking code this assertion may fail. Indeed, while we are waiting for the result of DB purchase item to arrive back, there may have been an intervening event which may have caused changes within our uh, cashier reactor object. To allow developers to know when such implicit uh, updates uh, can possibly happen, it is necessary at least to make it clear where exactly those points where the state can be implicitly modified can potentially occur. 
on the slide, those points are marked with a re-entry marker for function calls. There is no special meaning uh, for re-entry here. It is merely intended to illustrate some kind of marker. As we will see, equivalent markers will look very, very differently depending on the uh, technology, uh, specific technology we are using. However, my current point is that we have to have some kind of indication for those points where the state can change. With this in mind, my current uh, point of view is that this code on the slide is the best one we can actually get for our non-blocking code. At the very least, I haven't seen anything better. As such, I will consider it as a holy grail uh, non-blocking implementation for our example uh, scenario of item purchase. And we'll use this holy grail code as a baseline for comparison for all our eight non-blocking takes. Historically, uh, first non-blocking implementation were, were based on play messages. Such an implementation for our item purchase example is shown on the slide. Yes, it is this bad. Let's take a bit closer look at it. First, we need to create a struct to store the context of our request so we can handle return properly. There is nothing really uh, meaningful here, but we still have to write this boilerplate code. Nothing interesting. Then we have to have a map to request, uh, request IDs to this uh, structs with which store the context. Uh, again, there is not much meaningful here. I should mention that while in some cases it is possible to say, for example, that there is only one uh, outstanding request per type, in general, it is usually better to avoid uh, this kind of things as uh, they have a tendency to become unmanageable very quickly. The same stands for ad hoc tricks, uh, which allow to identify replies by embedding additional information into reply with, uh, instead of request ID. As we got our initial request from the client, we need to save the context into the struct, compose the message using a function provided by our ideal compiler, send the message, and save our struct into the map. By the way, in addition to being extremely verbose, this code is also very error-prone. Uh, this kind of code is not only ugly, but it's pretty easy to make a mistake when typing it in. Then, on receiving a reply from our DB reactor, we need to find uh, the request in the map and check its status. Now, just for a change, we have one line of non-boilerplate meaningful code, the one which was present in our non-blocking version. But, as you have already guessed, it is followed by even more boilerplate. Overall, amount of boilerplate code in take one is enormous. Out of over 70 lines of code in our take one, only about 10 are meaningful. It becomes especially obvious when we place uh, 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 take one code and holy great code side by side. This slide pretty much summarizes the problems with take one. Amount of boilerplate code is so large that all the business logic is completely buried in it. What's interesting, though, is that I've seen perfectly working systems based on this kind of non-blocking handler, though uh, their maintenance costs was a completely different story. For our take two, we will uh, consider a technique which is quite popular in game development today, and is based on uh, non-blocking void only RPC calls. The idea behind using void and non-throwing RPC calls is that 
as there is no reply whatsoever, it means uh, that we don't need to answer a question what to do when the reply arrives. On the other hand, such uh, void-only RPC calls provide only very marginal improvement of, of plain messages. In particular, to um, uh, implement a typical request response example, we have to use two uh, void-only RPC calls, one to send request and another to send reply back. As a result, most of the boilerplate code from take one is still present in take two. We still have to use request context struct, map of request IDs into these structs, as well as we have fill the context on sending request and find it on receiving reply, and all the options, all the opportunities to get things wrong are still already here. Overall, improvements in uh, readability of take two uh, compared uh, to take one are, are not as large as we'd like them to be. While 50 lines of code is indeed better than 70, uh, it is still five times more than in our uh, Holy Grail code. Our take three is about object-oriented callbacks. It is a thing which I was doing myself about 20 years ago when architecting a pretty large reactor-based system. The architecture is still in use uh, pretty much without changes and it does work. As we can see from slightly increased font size, take three is just a bit less verbose than take two. With uh, take three, it is all about callback objects. And it takes lots of boilerplate to describe them. We need a callback object uh, to handle return from our non-blocking request to the database. And again, there is nothing really meaningful here. It's just boilerplate. And another callback object for the non-blocking call to our game world. And only after we are done with describing those callback objects and are over 50% down our TX3 code, uh, we get to somewhat meaningful stuff. It is still has lots of boilerplate, but at least it is interspersed with something meaningful. Currently highlighting the code is processing of our original purchase request uh, from the client. And here is the return handler. One thing which we can notice about take three is that there is no, lo no longer explicit handling of the request ID to callback mapping in this code. Uh, while these maps are still present behind the scenes, we managed to hide them from the view of uh, application level developer, which is actually a big relief. If we compare our take three to our baseline Holy Grail code, we'll see that uh, take three, while being less verbose than take two, still has like four times more lines of code than uh, Holy Grail one. On the plus side, however, in addition to being less error prone uh, than takes one and two, we can see that meaningful code is concentrated in a smaller portion of the, uh, our take three, which improves its readability. Overall, take three, while being verbose, has been observed to be perfectly usable and perfectly working. I would even go as far as saying that it is the best thing we could do before the advent of C++11. And most importantly, before lambdas, for lambdas. Yeah. Up to now, all our takes uh, were doable even in C++98. Now let's see how we can improve it with the power provided by C++11. Our take four is all about lambdas, more lambdas and even more lambdas, leading us to uh, an infamous lambda pyramid. We can immediately see that uh, amount of boilerplate has uh, reduced drastically. Actually, it is the first time when the code at least is at least somewhat readable on one single slide. 
Ideologically, in uh, the code in our take four is actually very similar to the code in the, to the object-oriented callbacks in take, take three. It is just that instead of those verbose uh, object-oriented callbacks, we are using uh, lambda closures uh, conveniently generated for us by the compiler behind the scenes. Here are our lambdas. One important point about C++ and lambdas is that uh, while we are using lambda capture by copy, it still captures current object, the one referred to by this pointer, by reference. Accidentally, this is exactly the behavior which we want to have for our purposes. We do want to capture uh, stack variables by value, so they survive uh, when we exit from our cache purchase item function. But at the same time, we do want to capture our reactor object by reference, so we can access its current state when processing our non-blocking return. If we compare take four to our holy grail code, we'll see that verbosity wise they're about the same. However, readability wise, take four is still far from perfect. And it will become even more obvious if we introduce uh, exception handling. Most importantly, the code which is logically linear on the right side becomes nested within our take four code. This, as well as counterintuitive indents for the uh, logically linear code is what earned uh, take for the name lambda pyramid. As soon as the number of uh, non-blocking operations uh, in original linear code uh, goes to four five, the whole thing becomes uh, quite poorly readable. Let's see how we can improve it further. Our take five is about so-called futures. Very, very briefly, the idea is to create a placeholder known as future, where the result of certain operation which will only become known in the future can be stored. And as soon as we have those future objects, we can specify actions which uh, have to be done as soon as the result within the future becomes known. These uh, actions are often referred to as continuations. If we compare our take five to our baseline holy grail code, we will see that verbosity of futures is still in check. But unlike lambda pyramids, the code which is uh, linear on the right is still linear on the left. I certainly say that take five is the best we discussed so far. By the way, as an added benefit, concepts such as uh, we need to wait for two RPC calls to complete are easily expressible with futures too. Last but not least about our take five, let's note that in spite of being conceptually similar to STD future, our reactor futures are not identical to it. Most importantly, uh, STD future, at least as of now, is mostly about thread synchronization. And our reactor futures, uh, they operate within uh, uh, the context of one single thread and actually are all about continuations. As a result, uh, reactor futures are more similar to Foley future, though it seems that future futures from STD experimental will implement continuations and can be used uh, for this purpose. If we extend the idea of futures even further, we can get to constructing the whole code trees from lambdas. The value of such approach becomes obvious as soon as we realize that not all the code is linear. And, there are, and that there are conditions and exceptions. As we are very limited on time today, I won't give an example with conditions, but here is an example comparing our holy grail code with exceptions added 
so it's inherently more complicated than previous uh, Holy Grail code. We uh, will compare it to the code builder approach in uh, take six. The idea behind code builder is that we are effectively building a code tree in runtime. And as soon as this code tree is built, we can, uh, our, uh, then our infrastructure code can run it in a perfectly asynchronous manner. Most importantly, uh, for our current purposes, is that elements of our code tree directly correspond to the elements of our original Holy Grail code on the right. Whenever we have try on the right side, we have a corresponding T try on the left. Whenever we have linear code on the right, we have more or less equivalently looking code on the left, and so on. And even we, if we have loops with non-blocking calls within, which are pretty difficult to handle, we will still have a one-to-one -one correspondence between blocking code and non-blocking one, and with exactly the same nesting too. Overall, take six, by, while being admittedly more verbose than take five, is much more flexible than that, and before the advent of core weight, uh, it could be a good choice for more complicated use cases. By the way, if we introduce uh, preprocessor into the picture, we are able uh, to reduce verbosity uh, of uh, take six significantly uh, while preserving all its good properties. Uh, where the improved readability is worth the trouble of debugging uh, uh, code with heavy preprocessor macros is an open question, but such a possibility does exist. Our take seven, well, we are getting close to the end, uh, will be about uh, stackful coroutines uh, and or fibers. Fortunately for us, we don't have to go into a lengthy discussion uh, about the differences between the two. For us, it's sufficient to say that fibers and st stackful coroutines are pretty much the same for our purposes. In non exactly standard, but still widely cross platform C, stackful coroutines are represented by boost coroutines. So, personally, I'd prefer to my ideal compiler to use boost context uh, directly. As we can see, the code in our take seven on the first glance looks uh, better than that of take six and take six A. However, it comes to a, at a cost of two important caveats. First, with stackful fiber coroutines, it becomes very difficult to serialize the state of our reactor and to achieve quite a few all important properties of reactors, including such beauties as post-mortem debugging and low latency fault tolerance, it is necessary to serialize reactor state. Granted, in C++, uh, uh, serialization is not a picnic even with lambdas, but with stackful coroutines, I don't even know how we can approach this task. By the way, if somebody uh, in uh, audience knows, I would be very interested in hearing it uh, after the talk. Even more importantly, uh, stackful coroutines come with a big, fat uh, word of caution. While with fibers coroutines, we can avoid futures and write the code exactly as blocking one, which is shown on the left, we don't really want to do it. When we compare our take7x using x to denote that it should not be used to the Holy Grail code, we'll notice that there is one important thing missing from the code in take7x. It is those re-entry markers, which are necessary to indicate points where the state of reactor can be potentially changed. This, in turn, as we discussed above, leads to a difficult to see errors and to significantly increased code maintenance costs. As a result, I do not recommend using uh, Take7x uh, for real-world projects. A really short uh, real-world story in this regard. Some time ago, I was presenting the Take7x option to a billion-dollar company having several million lines of uh, reactor code. The point was uh, to change their current Take3 code with something more modern and palatable. Long story short, after, uh, right after I presented them with uh, Take7x, they asked me, hey, how we will know those points where the state can be modified? 
it illustrates one of the earlier race points, that those re-entry markers on the right are really important uh, for real world non-blocking development. Our last take, take eight, is related to the concept which is uh, well known for other programming languages, such as C Sharp, but is a new kit on the block for C++. I'm speaking about a weight which was recently renamed into Core weight. As of now, it is not a part of the standard yet, but implementations uh, are available both for MSVC and Clang. As we can see, the code in take eight is almost exactly the same as our Holy Grail code on the right. Even our re-entry markers have exact counterparts on the left side. Still, we have to note that at least for as of current C++ proposals, take eight is not 100% ideal for our purposes. Most importantly, it has problems with serializing uh, the state of our reactor. And while the problem is not as severe as that, uh, that of what takes seven, it is still going to cause quite a bit of trouble. On the plus side, it might be possible to serialize our reactor uh, with uh, core weight by as a part of serializing the whole allocator. But it is rather tricky, relies on certain properties of underlying operating systems, and as a result causes complications with such uh, things as ASLR. From our current perspective, it is also not 100% clear whether it is really guaranteed that uh, all the core weight frames will really go uh, through our own allocator in all compilers and libraries. You. Uh, uh, now, as we are done with describing our takes, uh, we can compare them. Most of this table sh should be self-explanatory, but a few things do need an additional word or two. Of course, readability is inherently subjective. There is no way around it. But it certainly exists, and it's certainly very important. As for hidden state changes, it is essentially about having those re-entry markers uh, or reasonable facsimile to denote points where the state of our reactor can suddenly change. Note that for take seven, we cannot really enforce re-entry markers on the, on the functions uh, which call our RPC functions. So in case of nested calls, uh, re-entry markers are gone. This is pretty bad as we will need to resort on uh, non-enforceable things such as uh, naming conventions to denote such uh, potential points of change. And uh, this will lead to increase in code maintenance costs. With regards to serialization of takes four to take six, it essentially hinges on uh, serialization of lambdas. Uh, currently it's uh, pretty complicated subjects, but at least uh, there are two potential ways of doing it, which were seen to work at least in certain contexts. The first way is to have uh, some kind of preprocessor which will replace all those lambdas back with uh, object-oriented callbacks, which are serializable. And the second way is to serialize the whole allocator, including all the lambdas. While neither of uh, those approaches is perfect, they seem to work, although with a fair share of trouble. For core weight, for serializing core weight, my current understanding is that it might be doable using, but we have only the second option to serialize it as a part of the whole allocator. And uh, as I already mentioned, it's quite a risky one. Uh, there are both risks related to clashes of virtual addresses uh, when deserializing and risk related to compiler libraries ignoring uh, our locators for whatever reason. Overall, I'd say that depending on specific of your project, uh, three different approaches may happen to be viable. The first one is object-oriented callbacks. They are good, old, working for sure in, even in C++ 98, uh, and having, they have no problems with serialization. They are not exactly the most readable ones, to put it mildly, but if you want a sure fire approach which uh, will uh, work and which will allow to serialize your state without the need to experiment, uh, they will work at least for smaller projects, and I also seen it working for a million lines of code project too. 
Second option uh, is futures. Uh, they are good if you want to stick to C++11. Uh, on the other hand, serialization is going to be quite a bit of headache, but it's generally solvable one way or another. The last one, co-await, is almost perfect for our uh, purposes. Still, serialization is going to be uh, even a bigger headache than for futures, while hopefully it's still doable. To summarize, while quite a few takes are usable in real world, uh, unfortunately, none of them represents an ideal a solution for our non-blocking problems, at least not yet. Now, let's discuss current C++ standard proposals and what we want from them from our non-blocking handling perspective. First, there is core weight currently built as stackless uh, coroutines. Uh, as of now, core weight seems to be the most likely thing to make it into the next uh, C++ standard. And uh, in my not so humble opinion, it's certainly the most viable proposal out there. There is still a significant issue with using uh, current core weight for our purposes and it's related to serialization. Uh, but, well, uh, that's still the best thing we can have. The second uh, proposal is uh, boost style stackful coroutines. So I know that Gore prefers to, know, uh, to name them fibers. From our perspective, with stackful coroutines, one big problem is that we hide reentry markers, uh, that we can hide reentry markers uh, in nested calls, uh, which will cause a quite significant increase in maintenance costs. Plus, situation with serializing stackful coroutines is even worse uh, than for core await. So, uh, uh, rough translation, I have no idea how to serialize stackful coroutines, even if we are speaking about serializing it into exactly the same executable. The third proposal uh, on our list is so-called resumable expressions. To be perfectly honest, I do not, this, uh, do not like this proposal for two big reasons. First, it doesn't allow to enforce uh, re-entry style markers, which is pretty similar to stackful coroutines. And second, while implementing a weight style logic, they are using mutexes and with devastating results to more on it a little bit later. The last one on our list is so-called call CC, call with current continuation. I have to admit uh, that I don't know much about call CC. That's why the gray color on the slide. But it seems to me that it's way too low level uh, to be intuitively used in app level uh, code. Now let's give a few pointers on what is important for our non-blocking purposes implementation wise. As none of those proposals is uh, carved in stone yet and implementations are even less so, there are a few things out there which either do exist but can magically disappear from the draft and things which we'd like to have, well, it, if not now, but at least in the long run. First, we do need to see those points where the state of our uh, reactor can be suddenly changed. In this regard, I'm a very big fan of so-called suspend up and out model used by uh, co-await knee uh, resumable functions. Using an opportunity to uh, speak to uh, mem some members of the committee, please, please do not throw suspend up and out model away, especially on the premises such as, this, such as those in P0114 or 0. During our discussion, we mentioned uh, serialization quite a few times. Overall, it's a very, very important feature uh, in the context of using deterministic properties of our reactors and message passing programs in general. In particular, practical implementation of such things as uh, post-mortem production debugging and low latency fault tolerance do require to serialize the state of our reactor. On the other hand, it is very clear that currently without any kind of serialization available uh, in C++, we cannot ask uh, to serialize lambdas or uh, uh, await frames. Still, there are two things we could ask, humbly ask for. First, we want to be sure that await frames are using only heap and not stack, nothing else. 
It seems to be the case now, but as it's not codified, well, anything can happen. This would allow uh, to, um, us to implement this kind of serialization we need. It will be ugly, but as a stopgap measure, it will do. In addition, when serialization is supported, using static reflection or otherwise, we want to have it supported also for lambda closures and for weight frames. In particular, when static reflection is ready, please make it sure that it does cover both lambdas and await frames. Not sure whether it's feasible, but well, at least uh, we can ask for it. Last but not least, for stackful coroutines, uh, having uh, current stack serialized and deserialized later, assuming it is exactly the same executable where we're deserializing it, might be of use too. Last but certainly not least, we don't want mutexes uh, within implementations of whatever coroutines are pushed at uh, us by the almighty committee. As practice has shown, mutexes are so difficult to deal with that even the committee members can easily leave a bad mutex-related bug in their code. To show this, let's take a look at the proposed implementation of await in P0114.0 also known as resumable expressions. As for using it, it is more or less on par with our take seven, not perfect, but more or less usable. However, the devil as always is in details. I would be really happy to say that implementation of a weight is an implementation detail, but, so we shouldn't care about it, but there is a significant problem with this specific implementation. The problem is that emulation of a weight in resumable expressions is mutex-based. In practice, it will mean that there is a potential shell context switch at each of those points. And as uh, context switch takes at least 2,000 CPU cycles uh, and uh, can easily go, uh, and if we account for cache validation costs, it can easily go up to a million uh, CPU cycles, well, I cannot say that I like it. To make things even worse, implementation proposed in p 114 r 0 calls a user-defined function from under the hidden mutex. Such a practice has been observed to lead to unexplainable to user uh, deadlocks happening once a month. It is worth noting that this problem was first described as early as in 98, when analyzing a, a hopelessly buggy multi-threaded STL implementation which, carried, uh, which accidentally carried a copyright by uh, another WG21 member. The worst case of observed behavior was what is seen in developer space as deadlock on one single recursive mutex. This is a thing which cannot possibly happen unless there is a second mutex conveniently provided by the library exactly to allow for, for this deadlock to happen. My educated guess is that the same problem exists for P0114R0. Necessary disclaimers. Code in P0114R0 is convoluted enough so I might have misread it. Apologies if it's the case. Most importantly, both the problems arising from using the mutex might be fixable or not. Honestly, I don't even see why this mutex is there in the first place, but well, if there was a reason, then we may be in trouble. Fortunately, our further discussion doesn't really depend, uh, depend on uh, P0114R0 being fixable. But it illustrates the all-important point of avoiding uh, mutexes when implementing uh, coroutines. To summarize this uh, long and, uh, as I see by some people leaving, uh, probably boring talk in one single slide, uh, let uh, uh, we can say the following. First, we do need a way to handle non-blocking returns. And uh, it is all about interactions with, uh, between uh, main processing and return call processing and potential changes to the state in between. As a result, we do need a way to clearly see when the state can, has a potential to change. Uh, re-entry marker or whatever, for, whatever uh, replacement uh, technology can provide. Second, 
Unfortunately, none of the uh, options we have to handle non-blocking returns in C++ is perfect. Some options are outright ugly, some don't allow to see potential for state change, and some are not easily serializable. On the other hand, uh, I am uh, comfortable to say that as of now, core weight is uh, certainly our best shot. It is the best we can realistically get in foreseeable future. On the other hand, when serialization comes to standard, I certainly appreciate to, a way to serialize or statically reflect such things as lambdas and uh, core weight frames. This concludes uh, our very intensive talk. I hope that I was able to convey my thoughts in a digestible manner. Now we have three minutes left to answer some of your questions. Hi, um, could you elaborate a little bit on why you see serialization as, uh, as such an important priority? Because uh, one of the advantages of reactors is that we can make them deterministic. Uh, and to abuse, to use or abuse the determinism, one of the things we want to do is to be able to serialize the state and then write, so in theory we could serialize just all the events. But in practice, serializing all the events for a program over last, over which runs over days, it's not practical. So what we need is to have a snapshot, from time to time to have a snapshot and then write all the events so we can realistically deserialize it. Because uh, it's just, well, uh, uh, otherwise, uh, the length of the, uh, all the events will be completely unmanageable. Okay, thank you. So I know that one of the problems with the uh, Lambda pyramid is that it's extremely difficult to write unit tests for. Could you comment on unit testing for some of your other proposed solutions? Mm. It is, uh, when we have reactors, uh, actually it happens that the most uh, popular and arguably the most efficient way of testing is testing at the level of events. So uh, it is uh, fairly rarely that we really need to go into the unit testing which goes below the level of processing individual, uh, individual messages. So the usual way of testing reactor is uh, to have uh, an engine which just throws events at your reactor and uh, then uh, you have all the thing reproducible because the whole thing is uh, perfectly deterministic by definition. As for unit testing, it is done, but honestly, I didn't uh, really see it happening in the Lambda uh, context. You are right. It is, it is a headache, so. Coy weight might be, uh, might be the answer here, but still yet to be seen. No questions. As always, it means uh, that uh, either everything is clear or that nothing is clear. I hope uh, that it is the first one. Thank you.